Welcome back to the table. Today we are here to give you a preview look at the next Feld City Collection game. This is number six, and this is Cuzco, which is a re-implementation of the classic Feld Bora Bora. Yeah, and if you've watched the channel, Bora Bora, we've talked about it. Bora yeah. Bora is probably one of, if not the most complicated, heaviest Feld, in my opinion. Um, I thought that the newer Marrakesh might surpass it, but mm. after having kind of revisited Bora Bora and then definitely playing it with Cusco, uh, this has this is a little complex game. It's got a lot of different moving parts, for it, sure. It, it is. Bora Bora was always considered, I think, one of his heaviest games, and they have maintained that. This is uh, pretty close to what Bora Bora presented, although the theme has changed dramatically to this Incan Empire. It takes place in Tuatan Suyu, the city of Cusco, which really, really works well, I think, for what you're doing in this yeah. game. And they've actually thematically tied in all of the actions to how things actually worked. In that time period, runners uh, would send messages to all the different cities of the Incan Empire by literally running across these roads. And that's thematically what you're doing. You're running across these roads and you're dropping off Kipu. these kipu which are, it's an intricate system of colored string and knots that I guess the Incan Empire used to keep records. They would tie the knots almost like a braille pattern and people could read it. It's a very sophisticated way of, of preserving messages and carrying those messages yeah. across the empire. And they've really kind of focused the whole theme around of the game around that and around the city of Cuzco. So this, of course, still kind of highlights that city. In fact, it has an entire board of the game that they've dedicated to the city. And then the second board, which is the whole of Tuatan Suyu, the Incan Empire, where you're gonna have all these different villages with Cuzco in the center. And then of course, the action board yeah. down at the bottom, which is the meat of the game is, is how you're taking those actions. Yeah, the action board is really interesting here. This is a dice placement. And in fact, this is probably one of the early dice placement games. Uh, now yeah, that I think of Bora it. Bora was, yeah. Um, but yeah, you're gonna be placing dice on these actions and it is, super tight and constricting because as you place dice, most of the yeah. spaces require you to place a die of not a certain value, but the values are going to matter. But most importantly, once someone places a die, the next die has to be of a lower pip value. So at the very beginning of the round, I could place a one in a section and effectively, for the most part, no one else is really gonna right. be able to go and take that action for the rest of the round. So that's things like that are going to happen in this game where you're like okay there's a lot to do and what six rounds to do it six rounds to do it and, and that might sound yeah. like a lot but it is, it is definitely not this it is hard to get a lot of things done well it's a very restrictive game yeah. not just in the fact that people are going to be blocking off spots and making it harder for you to go there but also that each action is going to be powered by the pips of the dice in some cases you need a specific value to even take that action and so if somebody played a die that is even lower and forcing you to go even lower than that, it might prevent you from doing exactly what, what you wanted to do. In a four player game, there's eight actions spread out below and each one of those actions can hold dice. So you're competing with players, uh, not only to do the action you want, but at the value you want, you're also competing for first player, which can be very important because it lets you get first dibs on taking whatever action you want. Yeah, it is interesting because those decisions, especially at a four player game, but even at two, you're looking at the dice that you've rolled up and everyone has three dice and you're thinking, okay, I'll use this dice for this, this dice for this. Right. But then you go, okay, if I use this dice for this, I definitely want to do that. But then I'm risking Ryan going to that next place that I want to go to and using his die. So if I use my three first and then I have these two fours left and he uses something lower than a four or even a four, yeah on an action space that I wanted to go to, I'm not using that action space. So I'm gonna have to change my plans for sure. Yeah, now one of the things that was great uh, that they brought from Bora Bora that they actually kind of changed, oh, a few things they changed, but one yeah. thing is the God cards. And that is the one thing that lets you actually break the rules of the game. So as we talk about the rules, as we talk about what you're doing, just keep in mind that there are always ways to maybe try to do the thing you're wanting to do by using those God cards. And you can play them from your hand. With offerings, you can play them directly from the row by using the these medals that you can earn over the course of the game. And unlike Bora Bora, where you just had a stack of God cards and different colors would come out randomly, they've actually divided each stack by color. Yeah. So you always have access to each of the five gods, which goes a long way in helping you complete missions, helping you get exactly the card you need when you need it. So there's a little bit more flexibility yeah. in that game. And you have a variable board now 
the original Bora Bora was just one flat board. This you're actually making up by placing the different districts of Tawat and Suyu. And they've added a central space as well that you can move back to, which rotates and allows you to kind of change the pathways so that you can use numbers a little bit more flexibly. So I think that there is a little bit more forgiveness in this game than Bora Bora, which is a little bit. It's still a very, very restrictive game. But let's talk a little bit about what you're actually trying to do yeah. in the game. Yeah, you've seen the main boards or boards out there on the table already, but you also have this massive player board. And I think, in my opinion, this is one of the things where the theme really kind of helps start pulling things together more than it did yeah. in Bora Bora. Because, like we said, you're doing a lot of those same things. If you're familiar with that game, particularly the end game scoring, there's like all these different categories. And those are all still reflected mostly here in your player space, but you're just collecting different things. In this case, it's this sort of like ink and mask and you're going to be collecting feathers around it triggering things under each of those feathers and then collecting sort of workers or yeah there's the the study studiers and the farmers the two things that made up the ink and empire which kind of replaced the men and the women which yeah, was the first what, game uh, had men and women which i think is a smart change i think you'll see a, sure. a wide diversity of these villagers in these cards but yeah some of them are studiers and they go to the university and some of them are farmers that go out to the fields again I think a thematic change that works for me better and helps me understand how these cards work a little bit better than just saying, oh, there's men and women cards. All the things on your player board feel like they're more connected, even just visually. If, forget the story and the theme yeah. behind it. Just understanding, okay, I want to get all of these by the end of the game. I want to get all of these by the end of the game. And the original Bora Bora was very similar to that, but it was a little harder to wrap your head around yeah. based on what you were looking at in front of you. Yeah, they've done a lot to streamline this game. A couple other things we'll talk about. But yeah, all the actions you're taking in the game are about either filling up your player board with a variety of different things or moving around the Tawat and Suyu map, dropping off the, the Kipu in the different cities that you visit along the way, which is going to collect you feathers that go onto your board. You're going to collect offering tokens, food, victory points, a lot of different things collected there. And then you're going to be collecting a lot of different things in your player board that are for in-game scoring. Although some of the things like the study tiles and the farming tiles give you intermediate benefits. They give you some points on a study track or collect food. They do a lot of different things. But all of that, everything you're doing in the game is controlled by those eight actions. Yeah, like we were saying, in the first phase of the game, you're going to be taking turns using an action here by placing a die and taking the corresponding action. Once all players are done that, you're going to move on to phase two. But in phase one, all these different actions do a variety of different things. These first two are going to let you move around that Tawat and Suyu map. There's a space here that just gives you two points. And this one, as you see, doesn't have the icons depicting, you know, the value being yeah. important. So anyone can go there and take the two points. It's kind of the last resort Right, action, when you, when you can't think. take any other action, you can at least get two points. This other action actually gives you a wide variety of things to do, and this is where you can place a really high value die or a low value, but the higher the better because you can do more things. You can use one pip value to activate or kind of move down any of those study tiles or farm tiles to trigger either collecting some food or moving up the scholar track here. Yeah, well that replaces the tattoo action from Bora Bora. And again, I'd like to say, I think that that's a little more thematic. It makes sense to me. You're taking the study cards and you're sending them off to the university to go up the university track. You're sending the farmers off to the field to, to collect get food. food. That just makes more sense. That works really well, I think, for me. Yeah, and then you could also spend two pips at a time to do one of four different things. Yeah, getting extra feathers for your ceremonial headdress, moving the kipu off your board into a reserve to clear more spaces for cards. You can collect offering tokens, god cards. You can get a variety of different things from that action. And then a few of the actions are gonna interact with the actual board over here. One of them is placing your priests on this priest track. This is like the ceremony track from Bora Bora. You're putting your priests out there. They're going to score you points every single turn that they're out there. And they're going to give you access to these icons or these idols, which are going to let you use God cards. So they are really valuable. So there's a lot of competition that's going to happen on that track. And there's a whole unique bumping mechanism. If you yeah. go into someone's space, they get bumped down and bumped down and all the way. You can end up bumping yourself off the board. You're also coming to this board to recruit the studiers and the farmers. And you have to have spaces on your player board in order to fit them, which means you have to be delivering the kipu out onto this board. So you're starting to see how everything is connected. Very much so. And, you know, having that mask, like David said, does make it feel a little easier to tell what, which actions you're doing and how they're going to impact your player board overall. 
Yeah, and once everyone's taken all of their actions, using all of their dice, you're gonna move on to the second phase, which is the studying farming. This is going to bring those blue and orange tiles into play again. This is not where you move them down, but you can effectively just choose one blue and one orange tile to use their core ability, whether they're up or down on your board. And there are even some god cards that will let you do a little bit more with that. All of the god cards, in fact, will fire off at different phases, and that's signified in the upper corners of each yeah. god card. Yeah, and this is going to let you take actions. It's going to let you move on the board. It's going to let you collect resources. A lot of that is going to be things that you will need because during the next phase, phase three, which is the Cusco phase, you're going to be spending a lot of the things that you've been collecting over the course of the round. Yeah, this phase starts right here at the university. You're going to just simply look at this track and we're, depending on where your player piece is, you're gonna collect those points and then these are all going to reset and whoever was furthest on the track is gonna be the new first player. And in fact, however the players were dispersed on that track, that's the player order. So this is one of those yeah. games where you're gonna bounce around the table as you take your turns. Then you're going to the temple track. This is where you're going to sort of resolve those priests. You're gonna look here, you're gonna get a number of points per priest that you have there, depending on what round you're in. And then also you're gonna to look to see who has the most priests. And if it's tied, whoever has the priest in the highest yep. position is going to get another one of these medals. Those medals, like Ryan said, can be used to activate those God cards. What's unique about them compared to the offerings is the offerings use God cards in your hand. The medals just let you use any of the face up God yeah. cards and then it's discarded. And I like this idea of, of this whole face follows the river. And as you kind of move yeah. Feld down the river, he, which they give you a little Feld marker to represent Feld moving across the board. I think they've kind of snuck him into every game as a little bit of a marker. Uh, I don't know that they snuck him in, of, but he's in every game. Uh, then you go down to the market phase. And this is another aspect of the game where you can score a lot of points. Because every phase, every round, you'll have access to a row. This replaces the jewelry in Bora Bora. You're just coming to a market and you're able to buy by spending food. You can turn that food in for these valuable different pieces like jewelry and pottery and things like that. You can only ever buy the round you're on. So this is an element of the game where you kind of have to plan ahead. This is another aspect of the game where you're going to get points for doing it. If you can buy one every single round, you get a few extra points at the end of the game. So you really don't want to miss it on buying one. But of course, you're going to miss some stuff. That's you just are the going nature to, of the game. You are going to miss some stuff. And in fact, speaking of missing stuff, the next area here you go to is effectively going to let you accomplish a mission, for lack of a better term, and then take a new one. You're gonna have three at the beginning of the game. And yeah. these are effectively achievements that you need to be looking on the lookout for as you play the game. You might need two of a certain good. You might need to have uh, placement in a couple different locations out on the board, things like that. If you do, you're gonna get six points for every mission you yeah. do. You're gonna do one at this phase every round. Then you take a new one and replace it on the board. Again, this is another one of those things where if you don't complete even one mission, you're going to miss out on a little bit of the end game score. Yeah, you can potentially complete nine missions over the course of the game. You'll get six during the game. You even replace the very last one at the end of the game. You still have three. You can complete all three of those at the end of the game. It's another aspect of the game that requires significant planning because these are not necessarily easy to get. You need to have no plan for them. And sometimes if you know you've got one already ready, you want to grab one. Okay, now you know maybe you have two or three rounds to get to that mission gives you a little bit of a cushion, but they are still very hard to get. Again, you can't even miss one no. if you want to get the bonus points for that. And then of course, the last thing you do is just kind of refresh this area. You refresh the tiles, you refresh the missions, you refresh, uh, take away everything that wasn't bought in the market. And then you play that again and you do that six times. Hopefully by the end of the sixth round, when it comes time for in-game scoring, you've completed some of the sections on your player board because that's actually where you're going to get points at the end of the game. If you haven't completed a single section, then you're actually not getting in-game scoring points because that's where all of your points at the end of the game are coming from. Yeah, there's at least 36 potential in-game scoring points, maybe more, just from those things that you're finishing out. Again, it's gonna have all the feathers around the top of your player board, and then the circlets underneath those need to have been flipped as well, which is another action that we didn't really touch on too much. Then you're gonna wanna get all of your kipus out on the map. And I'm telling you, all of these things that we're talking about here are not easy tasks. No. In our game that we just played, you did one of them I did and I one. did one of I, them. I bought, I bought six goods from the market. I bought one good every turn. 
I missed one mission, so I couldn't get the bonus points for the mission. I missed a couple feathers. I definitely missed having the the kipu out on the board. So yeah, that they're all very difficult. And some, you know, one of the other thing is to have all study, you know, the study tiles and the farm tiles filling your board, which necessitates you getting all of your kipu out of the way as well. Yeah. Now, what's interesting or neat about this game and Bora Bora was the same way is when you're kind of talking about this, it almost feels impossible to do these things because there's just so much you need to do in only six rounds and only three dice. So you're getting 18 actions in the game, yeah. which is not a lot. But then you start to see how you can use those study tiles and farm tiles to create combos, how you can use some of those God cards to take extra actions or get extra bonuses. And it starts to come together and you start doing more and more and realizing, okay, but you're still not going to complete everything. No. If, if I'm teaching this game to someone, you definitely need to talk about pick one or two things and try to get them done completely. You're not going to get to do all of it. Yeah, if you think you can dabble, like I often do in a lot of these games, where I'll do a little of this, a little of this, you're, I mean, you'll score some points along the way. You do score a fair amount of points as you're playing the game, but at the end of the game, a lot of that end game scoring, if you, you need to like maybe focus on a couple yeah. of the mm -hmm. things. And the good news is some of those things are related, right? The circlets are related to the feathers. So if you're getting all the feathers, you know, try to focus on the circlets. Same thing with the kipu and the study yeah. uh, and farm tiles. So this is, again, like we said, another one of the Feld collection, the city collection games coming from Queen Games. It is coming to crowdfunding, I think packaged with Vienna, which is game number five, this yes. one's number six. So take a look for that crowdfunding campaign. I'm sure that these games are gonna get the same deluxe treatment we've seen from all the other city collection they are games. Indeed. So I'm excited to see what the deluxe will look like. Of course, we don't have that. We just have a prototype here. So. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to this game as well. So thank you so much for watching. Please let us know your thoughts down below. Ask us any questions, comments. We'll do our best to answer any questions you have. Join us on Discord to continue that conversation. And until we see you again, keep having fun at the table. Bye-bye.